record here at the Mississippi Library. I'm really excited to see all of you turning out for this wonderful sort of hometown program. I want to thank our friends at UTV who are here filming for anyone that you might encounter that wants to see the video watch the library email newsletter or the posters in the main hall for information about that. And you can always sign up for our email newsletter on our library website under the About section. So I am pleased to be introducing our moderator, Jean. I didn't ask you how you pronounce your last name. Steele. Steele. Okay, Jean Steele. She wrote it here for me and I didn't even notice. <laughs> Is an educator, writer, and educational consultant. She is the librarian at Oak Hill Middle School. Did anybody have any kids at Oak Hill? Okay. Wow. Yeah. Go, Go Panthers! <laughs> where she takes pride in creating an inclusive, engaging learning environment where facts matter and all students are book lovers, even if they don't know it yet. Jean has contributed to various online publications and is currently revising her novel. Additionally, she has consulted for PBS and Media for several projects including their stand-up youth civics curriculum designed to empower middle school students to engage in positive change in their communities. Now that is a worthy thing to be doing. She lives in Newton with her husband, two children, and countless books. There's more at jeansteel.com. I just want to make a comment about the magnificent photographs that you see as a backdrop to our speakers. And by the way, Jean is going to be introducing our main speaker. Um, those photographs were taken by Heather Pilar, who was a news and documentary photographer before teaching in international schools in seven countries over four continents for the past 25 years. Can you stand up, Heather? And yeah, she's right there. Yeah, Heather's exploration of her negative negatives expands the original story of Maury's philosophies in a visual format. In this era of pandemics, an older population, and a failing healthcare system, there are no easy solutions to dying with dignity. Now, a quarter century later, Maury's philosophies continue to resonate universally. So she has set up this beautiful display. At the end of the program, I invite you to take a walk up onto the stage. We have stairs. Um, to, uh, I'm a little dyslexic, I think it's to your right. Um, and please do take a moment to look at the photographs and you can visit Heather's website at heatherpillar.com. I'd also like to thank Jean, who I just introduced, who will be moderating this evening, the Department of Senior Services of the City of Newton, who is co-sponsoring this program, and Newtonville Books, who partnered with us on this to help spread the word and um, is selling books at the end. Now, speaking of the book sale, if you want to purchase a book and have Rob autograph it, the way to do that is, that if you, let's start with if you don't want a book. If you don't want a book, please exit through those doors. There's a sign on the door that says, an alarm will sound, ignore it, it won't. That's only the one the building is blocked after hours. And you can go out that way. That will make room for the people who will make a line going out that door. I'll be at the back there to help keep you guys in shape so that it's a fair um, way of lining up to get your books. Rob will be happy to autograph them. And now I am done talking and I want to welcome Gene Steele. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I want to echo some of the thanks that you shared. I want to thank Mayor Ruth Ann Fuller for her support of this event the Newton Free Library, Ellen Myers, of course, the City of Newton Department of Senior Services, 
Newtonville Books, our local indie, fabulous indie bookstore, and photographer Heather Pillar for sharing your work with us tonight. But most importantly, I want to thank all of you for sharing your time. It is no easy feat leaving the house on a weeknight, <laughs> right? So thank you. I, I, we really, we don't take you for granted. Um, it brings me great joy to introduce the author of this book and the editor of this book. Maury Schwartz, born in 1916 and passed in 1995, is the author of the new book, The Wisdom of Maury, Living and Aging Creatively and Joyously. And it was just published last month by Blackstone Publishing. After being a professor of sociology and social psychology for over 30 years at Brandeis University, right down the road in Waltham, Maury wrote this new book after retiring at age 70. Maury, of course, is best known as the beloved subject of the classic multi, multi, multi-million copy, number one bestseller, Tuesdays with Maury. His groundbreaking 1954 book, written with Alfred Stanton, entitled The Mental Hospital, made him a superstar in psychology and helped him earn a full-time professorship as his first university position. It's a huge deal. I'd say this is my favorite line of all of Maury's accomplishments. Maury was dedicated to social justice and valuing human beings. And now, it's, still can't believe this is happening. This is my friend, Rob Schwartz. Hi, Jim. <laughs> All right, so Rob, of course, is, uh, is Maury's son, and he's also a music and film producer. And he's the editor of his late father's new book on aging, The Wisdom of Maury. Rob has recently appeared in interviews on Good Morning America, Nightline, PBS NewsHour, Good Day Sacramento, NBC10 Boston News, speaking about his dad's book. Additionally, Rob has extensive experience as a journalist, a music and film producer, and an entrepreneur. He's founded another, a number of companies, both in Japan and the US, and has held executive positions in others. His areas of expertise include producing numerous film and music projects in Asia, the US, and Europe. And in addition, he's been reporting for Billboard magazine on Asia since 2007. Rob is one of the producers of Wontopia, a benefit music festival slated for 2024. Check it out, it's really cool. And you can find information at wontopia.com and naturally the wisdom of Welcome. Thank you so much, Julie. Well, I'm going to ask you all to applaud again in a second because all of this would not have been possible without this woman right here. She, she organized it all. She made this happen. I simply showed up. Jean Steele. And I want to say for everybody, maybe some people know, some people don't, this is an incredible homecoming for us because we lived in Newton only a few blocks from here for 30 years. Uh, when we first moved to Newton, I walked home from the Newton Highlands tea stop, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. I walked through an empty field uh, on a corner to get to my house. This library now stands on that empty field. <laughs> Um, our house is literally two turns from here. <laughs> you go down Homer to Lowell, one turn onto Highland Street, and one turn onto Leonard Ave, and that's where we lived. And in addition to all of that, you guys are really mere yards away from the resting place of my father. He's buried in Newton and Walnut Cemetery right here. Um, so it really is a homecoming. No, Newton Cemetery, thank you. So. You said a, a homecoming of sorts. Um, this book is just, it's ubiquitous, right? Like I, when, I, when I've mentioned to people that we were hosting this event, you know, I, I don't want to assume people know about Tuesdays with Maury. So I'll say, oh, you know, if you heard of a book called Tuesdays with Maury. And more often than not, I almost get uh, uh, looks of like uh, people are a little offended. Like, <laughs> are you kidding me? How could I not know about that book? Because it's just legendary. 
Well, I mean, I, I certainly hope that that's the case. Truthfully, I think it's rather generational now. Mm -hmm. The book was published 25 years ago. I think people under 25, unless they studied in high school, and some people have, but if they're under 25 or 30, I've talked to a lot of people who don't know it. Generally, if you're over 40 or 45, you know it. And I mean, back in that era, early 2000s, it was a cultural touchstone. I mean, I was in a, a film festival in Japan watching the Simpsons movie when they mentioned the book, right? They mentioned <laughs> using the boy in the Stop. Simpsons movie. Stop. Oh, really? You don't know that's a no. little routine? It's hilarious. It's hilarious because it's a a book group and they say this week we're reading Tuesdays with Maury and the old lady says again you're the five people you're the five people I'll meet in hell <laughs> so a little Mitch Alvin medley there <laughs> oh my gosh that's amazing um, what we're already going off script. What is script? it like? We have a script? We have a script oh my god what what is it like when your your father now is just it's a first name basis it's Maury right so what is that like when you are halfway around the world and you you see a reference to your dad in the Simpsons you well, know what is that like that was obviously spectacular and I was overjoyed but in general in answer to your question yeah I mean it's wonderful that people know my dad it's really gratifying that he is such uh, you know influence and impact on people posthumously that's that's the kind of odd part right he didn't get to experience any of this in his lifetime, which is rather ironic because he would have loved it. People always ask that question. My father would have adored all of this attention. He loved the spotlight. He actually did go around the country talking to groups through Brandeis, women's groups, but it was very small and, you know, not, not a national kind of, no national attention. But uh, it's wonderful that people are so interested in him and his thoughts and receive him so warmly. And the, the flip side of that is, of course, that people think that they know my father. And, you know, as wonderful as the book is, they don't really know him. But, of course, that's just, you know, the way that it goes with people who are, who are well known. But it's wonderful that people feel so warm and so close to him. Mm. Would you share briefly, before we move on to talk about your book and your father's book, would you share the origin story of Tuesdays with Maury? Because I think a oh, lot of Tuesdays with Maury? Yeah. Like, well, they're related, so how about both origin stories? Okay, let's do so it. So the origin story of Tuesdays with Maury is that uh, my father was, you know, beloved professor, as you noted, and when he got ill, he started talking about what it was like to be dying and what values were important, and he formed little discussion groups with the circle of friends and academics and intellectuals that he was familiar with. And one of the professors at Brandeis knew the editor of the Boston Globe. And he said, this guy is really doing an interesting thing with his illness. And they sent a reporter named Jack Thomas, who does human interest stories, did human interest stories, was a wonderful writer. And he wrote a huge spread on the Globe, in the Globe on my dad. And just as fate would have it, one of the producers of Nightline is from Boston, Richard Harris, is a wonderful man, wonderful producer. He still subscribed to the Boston Globe. He saw the article. He said to Ted, why don't we bring this guy on? And then, you know, it was just this gigantic, usually Nightline only did one show on a subject, but it was so popular, they did three with my father. And of course, Mitch saw the first one mm -hmm. and came back and met my father and then wrote this book, yeah, wrote that book, Tuesdays with Maury. Yeah. And the origin story of this one... This is, is wild. I mean, it's, is it's it? like out of a movie. This <laughs> well, hopefully, <laughs> from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> um, so this one is, I had been traveling in Asia, and I came back to Newton, right, up the West Newton Hill from Newton North High School, and I spent three months there, and my father was writing this book in summer of 1989, summer or fall of 1989. And um, I got to talk to him about it and hear his ideas and, you know, bounce things back and forth. And then I moved to Japan and dad got sick and passed away. I was coming back and forth between Newton and um, Tokyo. And uh, one day, long after passed, sometime in the early 2000s, I was at home in our house and my mother had kept his study just as he had had it. And I pulled open a desk drawer and I found the manuscript. And of course, I remembered immediately that I had talked to him when he was writing the book. And I started reading it, and I realized, wow, we have to do something with this. This is you know, valuable. And now we have an opportunity to because of Tuesdays with Maury. 
It's amazing because when you found the manuscript, it was it, it was bound, right? Yeah, it was like, bound, a big black cover. I still have that, that of course, yeah. And your father tried to get it published? He did, he did. But you know, he had only ever published academic work. Mm -hmm. and he wasn't very well versed in the publishing game. So I don't know how he tried, but he wasn't successful. I don't think he ever got a literary agent, which is crucial if you want to get a book published like a, a you know, a general book like this. For, for academics, it's different. But for, for, you know, general writing, for popular stuff, you need to have an agent. And it's so, when you read the book, it's, it's almost like you're stepping out of time because your father wrote this book beginning in 1988 um, to 1992. And in the very beginning of the book, he references an illness that he's struggling with. And it's not ALS. Right. So we as the reader know what's ahead of your father, right. what's ahead for him. And, and yet, your father talks the talk and walks the walk in this book because you're reading his ideas around, as it says, living and aging creatively and joyfully, and he was doing that up until the end of his life. It's, right. it's, it's really wild to, to read it from this perspective. So you're saying it's like a flashback in a movie. <laughs> Sort of like a flash. I mean, I can. It really is cinematic, right? Rob goes to the desk drawer, opens it up. I, I don't think there's any movie producers in this room, unfortunately. <laughs> but you think about. I mean, we all loved those that read more Tuesdays with Maureen loved it, and then to have this gift, it's just it's unbelievable. Like plot twist. Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of different ways to look at it. I mean, Tuesdays with Maureen, the way Mitch wrote it is so much for a general audience. I mean, it's a thin book, you know, he writes it so you can just read through it very quickly. This is very different, you know, and it's great that Tuesdays with Maury came out first because it's so much, you know, it's so accessible. This one is really a deep dive into my father's thoughts. It really is very discursive. He discusses issues from many different angles. He includes stories and you know, newspaper articles, examples of what he's talking about, people, other people's stories, many, many other yes. people's stories are in this book. So, you know, you have to already be drawn to his thought to, to read something like this. So I think it's great, the order that they that come out. I think they really complement each other. I agree. Your, your father, when you, okay, so you found the manuscript, and at that point, your father is Maury, capital M, Maury. What was that like for you as his son, knowing that you were going to edit his work and he's not an obscure figure like he was in the late 80s and early 90s? Was that intimidating for you? No, not really. I mean, I have to say, when I was doing it, I didn't think about, you know, because it's always just been dad. I knew, of course, that he's well known and Tuesday with Morris incredible bestseller, but I didn't think about, oh my God, you know, what, what a, a burden. It didn't occurred to me that way at all, especially since, as I said, I had talked to him about it and discussed the ideas with him, and his voice is so strong and so present in that book that that was my major task, to make sure that I didn't screw up his voice, that his voice didn't come, you know, was somehow didn't come through. That would have been a catastrophe, but, you know, I think that his voice does come through very strongly, and it was very, you know, wonderful to edit it and sort of feel like we were having that conversation again. And believe me, some people ask this question, there was a lot of editing to do. It wasn't like just a brief read through because my father was an academic and he was long winded at times. So a lot of things had to be cut, but I think it's become very readable. I think he'd be very happy with it. You uh, mentioned when we've talked that your mother was involved in the editing process of a lot of your father's writing. That's right, yeah. What was her role in this? Right. Well, uh, initially I had to talk with mom and figure out, like, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do with this? And then she did start not editing the whole book, but passages of it to show me what she thought would be good, just to give me an example of it. So she was crucial in that sense, not that she edited a lot of the pages, but that she sort of gave me an example and gave me a guiding hand. And that is true, that my mother actually edited all of my father's academic work. Sometimes she got credit for it, and sometimes she didn't. Mm. 
Your dad opens the book talking about his um, his shock that he was an older man, mm -hmm. right? Processing, because we, we live in this culture, and your father writes about it here. He shared it with Mitch in Tuesdays, um, that we just, we are... We we are mired in this toxic environment of um, ageist ideas, mm. and he he talks about something called age casting. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? Sure, sure. So I mean, this was actually my father's original impetus to write the book, and it follows directly from the the previous story that I was telling. And you mentioned my father retired in 1986 at age 70, and he never thought of himself as an elderly person. He always had a super amount of energy. He was swimming every day. He was going to uh, really joyous um, dance um, celebration in Cambridge called Dance Free. I'm aware of it. That's why I'm saying it. <laughs> that we have a, an old veteran of Dance Free in the audience here. And um, this was when my father was, you know, 70 years old and certainly before that and even after that. So he never felt of himself as an elderly person, but he realized after he was forced to retire by the university, which is no longer the case, they no longer force people at 70 to retire, after he was forced to retire, he realized that society viewed him as an elderly person. And he didn't like that. And, he, and given my father's psychological bent, he had to investigate in time himself, why am I uncomfortable with that? Mm. And he realized that society had these ageist, these poisonous ageist attitudes, and that he himself had internalized this ageist attitude, which was really poisonous. And he realized that he had to work to expunge this from his psych psych psychological you know, makeup, and that he wanted to help other people do that. And then he coined this term that you uh, point to, age casting, which comes from typecasting in, in film, where elderly people are pushed into a certain role in society, which is you sit in the corner and do nothing, mm -hmm. right? And he thought this was so outrageous and so toxic, as you said, that he felt driven that he had to address this, and he had to try and correct this. And that's what this book is about. That is his direct impetus to write this book. And we talked about it a lot mm. in, in 1989. Mm. Well, I can imagine, because it's this idea where you suddenly don't have your own narrative. Your narrative is written for you, right? You don't have that same value or worth, or people make assumptions about you based on your presumed age. Mm. And that has to be... It has to be really, really frustrating. Right, and it was like a double whammy for my father because he had never thought about it. You know, he was a professor. He was constantly surrounded by people in their 20s and doing things that are associated with younger people like dancing and swimming and meeting people and going out. He was incredibly social. So he never thought of himself that way. So to have it all dawn on him at once, like now you don't have your job and this is what society thinks of you was quite a shock for him, yeah. And it's so powerful to read his words in the book. Like he says, um, there's no reason to be envious of people who are younger. And aging is not a problem we need to solve, but a stage in life to be lived well. What are some of your favorite techniques that your father offers in the book about celebrating and em embracing your age? Sure, sure. I mean, I think this is kind of the crucial part of the book because lots of people can read my dad's word and say, okay, it's great that he thinks that, you know, aging isn't so bad, but, but it is tough for a lot of people. So he offers a lot of different techniques to help people along on this journey. And, I mean, we can just fly through them. They are described in the book in a lot of detail. So, but, for example, he suggests meditation. Meditation is a key technique to calm yourself, to focus your mind, and actually increase your energy. There's a recent study. There was actually some studies in his time, too, but there's a more recent study that was carried out about six or seven years ago that said that uh, it was done in one, well, I guess it was done across a bunch of senior centers, that seniors who meditate tend to live on average five years longer than seniors who don't meditate. And that's, that's pretty stunning, given the fact that it's just simply, you know, whatever, concentrating on your breathing or whatever meditation mm -hmm. you want to do. 
So that's, that's one of them. Um, he certainly was really interested in getting people involved in life, involved in your society. He's like, find something that interests you and get involved in it, whether it's you know, a social thing or an artistic thing or whatever it is. Get involved in it. Find like-minded people. Create new connections. Make new friends. This was like a key for him to be involved with other people. If you cut yourself off from other people, you are going to wither. And that was really key for him. And that's also something that we really noticed during the pandemic, that seniors and elderly people who were cut off and had nobody to talk to, and this includes my mother, really suffered, mm -hmm. right? And so it's key to maintain the relations you have, build them, nourish them, mm -hmm. create new relationships. Yeah, there's, there's this idea of, of being a lifelong student in the book and evolving. And admittedly, so I'm 45, right? So I'm, I'm nearing the spot where I'm thinking about aging more. And today, a student, um, um, a student um, said to me, you know, I asked the student, you know, so how was your day? What did you do this weekend? Why not? Oh, I played tennis. And he went on to say, oh, he and his father played tennis. And I kid you not, for a hot second, I thought to myself, I always wanted to learn how to play tennis. Oh, but that time has passed. And it was like, gee, wake up. Like, have you not just read this book? Like, you can learn how to play tennis, right? But it's so we get hardwired to think that, well, this is who I am now. I don't play, I've never learned how to play tennis. And it's the, all these little exercises and these anecdotes your dad shares, it's like, it just loosened everything up in my mind. And that's exactly the intention. That's exactly right. I think you've hit on two key things. I mean, we talked about a ageism and you know pushing elderly people, society pushing them into a role. But we ourselves develop a self-image and then find it very hard to break through for that self-image. Like, I'm a person who doesn't play tennis. Well, you could learn to play tennis pretty easily. You know? yeah, heck yeah. And it's just a matter of adopting that attitude of I can experience anything, I can do anything, you know, mm -hmm. within limits, of course, but, but pretty wide limits. And that's exactly what my father is getting at in the book, especially with all the examples of, you know, very elderly people, 85, 86, 95 years old, the guy has graduated from college and wants to become a doctor, you know. Yes. There's a lot of stories, yeah. a lot of stories in the book. And know? I appreciate the global perspective that your dad offers because you see these clippings from the Globe, and the librarian me was so happy to see how sources were cited. Um, but you know, you have, and it's offset in a different color when it's you know an article from China about an elderly community. When, yep. Like, I love that, that it's very inclusive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. He tried, definitely tried to do that and reference other cultures because he felt, I think correctly, that other cultures are not like this society where elderly people are kind of shunted away. I mean, it, there's a varying degrees of thought, but certainly some places like China and in Asia, elderly people are more respected for their experience and their wisdom than, mm -hmm. than in our culture, for sure. So check this out. This was fake. Oh, I'll, I'll say one more thing. Oh, I yeah. just have to take credit. Uh, you'll notice the book is extremely colorful. There's color that runs through it. Um, and as Jean said, different, uh, different paragraphs have different backgrounds of color. This was my design idea. I didn't execute it. We had a wonderful designer at Blackstone, but this is something that, that I urge them to do because the book, my father is trying to get people to be more vibrant and to be more creative. So I tried to, to echo that in the design of the book. You did, you did such a, such a, such a good job. It's so, it's, it breathes life, right? It breathes life. Check this out. My uh, classroom, uh, the classroom next to the library where I teach at Oak Hill, um, I happened to pop in there um, not too long ago and the eighth grade teacher has a stack of Tuesdays with Maury on her desk. And I was like, wait, what? She's like, yeah, you know what? I decided to bring back this whole class novel this year. I was like, you're not <laughs> going to believe what I'm about to tell you. So Rob very generously came. He spoke to the eighth graders at Oak Hill Middle School recently. I mean, they crafted these amazing questions for you. And one insight, somehow we ended up talking about the popularity of your father and his ideas in China. Can you speak to that? Sure. I mean, I can tell the whole story if you want, which yeah. we didn't tell here. Um, I'll start out from 
again, from my, my perspective on it, I used to go to China a lot in the 80s and, and in the 90s. I hadn't gone for a while. In 2012, I went to cover a music festival for Billboard magazine. The, it was in Shanghai. The day before I left, I saw a notice of the play Tuesdays with Maury being performed in Shanghai at actually the most prestigious theater in Shanghai. And I was like, what the hell is going on? I was leaving Shanghai the next day, but it was like an alternate universe, right? So I actually reached out to Mitch and then Mitch's agent, and we tracked it all the way through. A professor had been at a university in Colorado, had read the book, had loved it. He was from Taiwan. He was a visiting professor. He licensed it, the play, not the book. He licensed the play for the Chinese market and made a success in Taiwan, and that led to success in mainland China. It has huge popularity in mainland China. Over 250 performances in mainland China. I did Q&A numerous times, both in Beijing and Shanghai, after um, many, many performances, and even had like presentations with the actors, not even before the play, just with me and the actors be doing a presentation to a huge audience. And yeah, it's just incredible, the, the popularity in, in China. It's really amazing. Is it a cultural component that we don't have here? Like, what do you? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that we don't have it here, because it's also pretty popular here. Sure. But yeah, I think it does speak to Chinese culture, because they have this tradition of respecting elders and the whole thing of master and student you know, I mean, it's portrayed in martial arts movies as kind of hokey, but, you know, an older person teaching a younger person, that's deep into Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's part of what spoke to them. This is two people, an older man and a younger man, and sort of wisdom being passed down. So I think it is really resonates with, with Chinese culture, yeah. In your afterward, both your forward and the afterward are beautiful. In the afterward, you end with uh, a mantra your father shared. Stay human. Right. Can you speak to us about that? Sure, sure. So, I mean, it's a great mantra, but I definitely think it needs to be unpacked because a lot of people hear that and it doesn't really explain itself. And what my father meant by stay human was stay connected to the fundamental experience of being human. And what are the fundamental experiences of being human? Loving your family enjoying your friends, loving your friends, increasing and strengthening your relationships with people, um, being creative, being artistic, basically all of the things that my father urges people to do in the book. And he's really suggesting throughout the book and at the end that this experience of being human is universal. And what connects us, and this is why he uses people you know, from all different cultures, what connects us is far, far greater than what divides us. And that's what we need to concentrate on, especially in this country, and especially right now. I know we didn't plan this, but this is the perfect way for me to segue, segue into my last question. Okay. Yeah, and then Ellen is excited for Q&A. Yes. Um, so both in Tuesdays, and in The Wisdom of Mori, your father talks about, um, he says, giving is living. That like giving makes him feel like he's living. Right. And he's, he's really pointed about the connection to aging well. And that really comes from not only caring for ourselves, like we've spoken about, but it's also about focusing on our common humanity. Right. And at the very end of this book, he writes that, if we were to create spaces to provide for its participants a sense of meaning and connection, as well as an avenue for giving back to others some of what life has given to us, if the whole world were set up in caring communities, I can only imagine what an awe-inspiring vision of humanity we would realize. And your father has given us another timeless gift through this book, and I'm equally as grateful that you and your family are sharing your father's wisdom with uh, us. So well, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. I want to say one thing, um, because I think I sent you this, but I saw this documentary last night, and I couldn't believe how relevant it was. So basically, what my father, one of the things my father is suggesting is that your attitude towards aging is completely going to define 
what kind of experience you have when you age. And then I saw this attitude, uh, sorry, this um, documentary last night, and I'm going to quote it exactly so you can find it online. It's by a neuroscientist at Yale University named Becca Levy, B-E-C-C-A Levy. And she put out this study in 2018, which studied a lot of people. It's a very broad study. She found that positive attitudes about aging extended life by 7.5 years and, and reduced risk of dementia by 50%. This just blew me away when I saw that. So that documentary is on YouTube. You can find it if you put her name in, Becca Levy and uh, neuroscientist. Um, and uh, you can watch the whole documentary. Isn't those crazy statistics? It, it's crazy, and yet at the same time, it, it, it makes sense, right? If you're, if you're questioning the culture, if you're questioning the message that, like your father said, just shove down your throat. If you're, if you're being human, right? Right. Then suddenly it all starts to make sense because we feel good when we connect. We feel good when we're giving back. It's... But not only that, I mean, this is the crazy part, but it's actually good for your body. Yeah. It's actually healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the mind body connection is yeah, wild. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I've asked a lot of questions, and I'm sure many of you have questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I am going to run around the room with, well, not run, I'll walk <laughs> with the microphone, so, uh, and Rob will be calling on you. Sure. And if there's a question for Jean, I guess. Sure. I think we can do that. I think we can do that. Well, this gentleman right here in the fourth row already. Hi, thank you. Um, the question I have is I consider myself being fairly positive and optimistic, uh, but the body doesn't always agree. Um, and I'm seeing in people my age, late 60s, mid 70s, a bunch of time, physical time bombs going off that uh, affect knees, hips, all kinds of health. How does he help you try to navigate through the medical challenges? Great question. Right. I mean, obviously, my father doesn't have any specific medical knowledge. <laughs> But he does talk about this in the book. As Gene pointed out, he was fighting asthma at this time and also aging, so having you know, little um, uh, aches and pains as well. And he talks about it. So the first thing he says in this book is that you have to accept it. If you deny it, it's not going to make it any better. You need to accept the reality that you're faced with as best you can. And then it's a process of moving on from there finding out what works for you, maintaining a positive attitude, but also accepting what's going on. And he actually addresses this philosophically. I don't know if this will help you, but my father calls this the tension of opposites, right? You need to balance things that are positive and things that are negative. He's not saying like, oh, just keep a positive attitude and pick daffodils and everything will be fine. That, that is not realistic. All of us know that, right? So you need to have a balance between what's going on in your life and things that are difficult and a positive attitude. Certainly, the advice that I would give you is that pursue everything that makes your um, actual physical ills better. Whatever makes them better, whether it's medical uh, treatment, whether it's massage, whether it's meditation, whether it's positive attitude, you should you know, pursue that. But certainly, my father would stress that if, as soon as you adopt a negative attitude, things are going to get worse. That is not going to help you. So of course you need to accept reality for what it is, but you need to keep moving forward with a positive attitude as best you can. Yes. Hi. Um, gosh, I have a few things I wanted to say. Um, um, the corridor from Manchester, New Hampshire, down to New York City is the longevity corridor. And all the work on extending life, actually age reversing, David Sinclair of Harvard, he's 50 years old, but his body biologically is 25 years old. So you can reverse. And uh, there's a whole bunch of things about that. So we're not, I, I asked how far back can you go? And we, I was told 50, 25. So, um, so if you want to, age reversing, there's a lot going on. I, I, have, I have some information about that. I mean, you know, there's a lot, of, there's a lot to say. And I don't know if you're sp sp specifically talking about resveratrol, 
but uh, not specifically. Not in general, okay, all right. Of, okay, yeah, okay. So, um, my question that I initially had is, what, what advice would your dad have given during COVID and even post-COVID? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one because it definitely flew in the face of one of his major pieces of advice, which is keep your connection with other people. But I think that he would have stressed that in, if you can't meet face to face, then Zoom as people did. And you know, people found creative ways to try and keep their relationships going or whatever. I mean, we all remember people who were talking to each other across rooftops or balconies or what have you. And you know, he would have said that that is a really, really great idea. But more specifically than that, it's hard to say because he didn't experience it. But yeah, I'm sure he would have been very, very saddened by that time when we were so cut off from each other. Who are your father's heroes, influencers? Sure, um, there's, there's a whole range of them. Um, I like to, to um, emphasize the sportsman because there's uh, some idea out there that he wasn't actually very into sports, which is completely untrue. He was a Bostonian and took me to all of the Boston sports teams numerous times when I was growing up, Boston Garden, Fenway Park. And so I'll start with them and then I'll move on to the heavyweights. So uh, my father loved uh, Ted Williams. Um, John McEnroe was his favorite tennis player. He thought, he told me he moves like a gazelle. He loved that. He said, if reincarnation is real, I wouldn't mind to be reincarnated as a gazelle. Because <laughs> he thought they moved so beautifully. And of course, Bill Russell of the Boston Celtics. And then, because he was an academic and an intellectual, there's some that are a little heavier than that. Um, so probably Martin Buber, who is a Jewish thinker, wrote a book called I Am Thou. It was a huge influence on him. Um, Eric Erickson, who is an early sociologist, was somebody he talked about a lot. Let's see if I can remember anybody else. I feel like I'm forgetting one. Yeah, Marsha, do you remember? He loved Auden. Right. As a poet, he loved W.H. Auden. And of course, that's in, that's in Tuesdays with Maureen, yeah. I'm trying to think if there was any other thinkers that I'm missing, but that, maybe that's enough. There was a gentleman back here, yeah. Well, the second one's rather broad, but all right, let me, let me think about this. This is one of those questions I have to think about carefully. Um, I would say probably, and this certainly informed my life, just to let you know, Gene didn't particularly read it in the bio, but I moved to Japan right after university and you know, led a rather unconventional life living overseas. And my father wasn't super happy about that because I was so far away, but it directly <laughs> sprang from one of the things that he told me, which is that, you know, live your life exactly as you want to, you know, creatively and also taking care of the people around you. You know, don't live your life as you want to, which means that you don't have to take care of people around you, but live your life as you want to with taking care of the people around you. So that, that's basically one of the things that he told me that really informed how I live. And what was it like being his son? Well, I mean, as I said, that's a broad question and there's many, many different kinds of answers. Um, he was beloved by his students, really. I mean, this is not an exaggeration. So when I was a kid, Brandeis University students would come up to me and tell me, oh my God, you're so lucky to have this man as your father. I mean, they were so jealous that this guy was so much better than their fathers. Which, of course, you know, made me a little bit uncomfortable. And also, as a kid, you always think like, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. In retrospect, I can see they kind of did know what they were talking about. But um, yeah, I mean, he was a wonderful father. It's not to say that he was perfect. I, I have to say this a lot. He was certainly not a saint. I mean, my father could, on a very rare occasion, become angry. I remember one incident, which I won't relate, but I thought he was being ridiculous, you know. Or, you know, he had blind spots now and then. My father was born in 1916, so feminist ideals didn't necessarily come. I mean, 
the ideals came easily to him. The practice didn't necessarily come easy to him. And I have a few examples of that. But, but you know, overall, he was a remarkable man who was filled with love. I mean, that's what anybody who knew him would say. You want to add anything, Marcia? This is my cousin here. He didn't like to cook. Uh, yes, he wasn't a very practical person. He didn't cook. He didn't know how to garden. I'll tell one story. This is between him and his brother, my Uncle David. My Uncle David developed polio at an early age and was sent off to the countryside. And because he was sent off to the countryside, he learned how to farm. He learned how to plant and farm. And when he was uh, elderly, maybe after 70, he moved to West Virginia and he had a little plot of land. Not a big farm, but a little plot of land which he farmed. And my father went to visit him there and observed him planting the seeds in spring. And after he saw David, David is my uncle, planting the seeds, he said to him, so when can we harvest? <laughs> he had no idea that it would take four months for this stuff to grow out of the ground. So not super practical. Very much an intellectual and an academic. Yeah. Other questions? So years ago, I had the privilege of working on a documentary about a Polish heroine, Irena Sendler, who saved 2,500 Jewish children from the Warsaw Ghetto PBS documentary. And while in Warsaw doing research for it, we found a thousand other backstories. The children who had been saved that didn't know they were Jewish, et cetera. And I know Heather is exploring the dynamic between Maury and his caregiver who is also on welfare and looking at that from a sociological perspective. Are there any other backstories that we might expect in the future? Oh, okay, uh, you did a little twist there that we might expect in the future. Well, I mean, uh, I am thinking about writing a personal book about my dad, which would not be so much about his thought and more stories about his life. So there are tons and tons of stories um, like that one, I don't know. I mean, he wasn't involved in, in saving uh, people during the Holocaust, so <laughs> that's pretty that's pretty powerful and heavy. But um, let me think if there's any story that I can come up with immediately. Um, well, something that I write that some of you here may know, you're the right generation, is that in addition to being a professor at Brandeis and teaching and writing and touring the country and lecturing. My father was uh, involved in providing low-cost mental health care to people in the community. He's one of the founders of a low-cost mental health care collective in Cambridge called Greenhouse, which I think ran until very recently. I think they closed it very recently. He, he founded it with a bunch of like-minded people, and they offered mental health care on a sliding scale, which meant that if you couldn't afford to pay, then you paid nothing. So it was essentially charity work, and it was something that was very important to him. And he, in addition to doing all these other things, was also a therapist and really enjoyed that work of trying to help people heal their psychological states. So there, there are a lot of stories related to that. And there's a lot of stories related to my dad, some of which may not have as much of a, you know, uh, 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 a moral to them, but just about who he was, whether they're about going to sporting events or um, all sorts of stories. I'll tell one story that's completely frivolous, just because, <laughs> since you asked, um, and people who are old enough will remember. As I said, my uh, father took me to lots of sporting events, and when I was about six years old, we went to the Boston Garden to see the Celtics play the Lakers. This is after Wilt Chamberlain was already on the Lakers. And we happened to have a seat that wasn't far from where the players, you know, the players used to walk on an aisle through the crowd. They don't do this anymore. Now there are tunnels that are separate from the crowd. But they used to walk right through the crowd to get to the court. And Will Chamberlain was walking on the court right past us, maybe about five seats away. And my father screamed out, Will, shake my boy's hand. And he held me up, and I was maybe five years old. And this gigantic arm, and people who remember Will Chamberlain, was 
giant of a man with this huge hand came out literally over five people's heads without him even reaching, you know, just, just sticking out his arm. And I shook one finger of Will Jackson's hand. So there's a story for you. Anybody else? Did we exhaust it? All questions? Oh, yes. Oh, I, I'm so did become more ill, and I'm just wondering if his own advice helped him through his uh, severe illness. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, a lot of this is documented in the Nightline programs, and he talks about it very honestly in those programs. So if you'll see, if you've seen those programs, and you'll remember, he says. You know, it's not like I just snapped into like, oh, I'll just be happy just because this is happening. He said, no, I mourned for myself and cried and wailed for a long time. But then he made, literally made a conscious decision. I am not going to let this define who I am. And I'm going to move forward and live as fully and as best I can while I'm alive. So it's not like it's easy. Nobody says that this is easy. There's a lot of challenges. But the point is, is that this is the best approach. This is the, best, this is the way that you can get the most out of your life for the time that you have left. And you know, his illness was very difficult, as you know. ALS is a horrible illness, and it just gets worse, right? And I mean, there's a lot of that is explained in the Nightline episodes. But yes, he certainly took his own advice and lived to the fullest as much as he could. Marcia, you have something to add? Yeah. Um, when Maury had ALS, he would wake up in the morning and um, he would spend, before he got out of bed, he would spend a certain amount of time, I don't know if it was 15 minutes, but he would, every morning he said he would go through a grieving process of saying, of, of feeling how uh, sad and, and other you know, negative feelings about what he was going through, and then he would set that aside mm -hmm. and proceed on with his day. Um, so that's one of the ways he embedded grieving for his own illness with his positive, uh, you know, embrace of, of living. Thanks, Marcia. Last question, or do we have time for more? Massachusetts. I'm on edge here. Uh, my father was extremely agnostic. Or his joke was, I used to be an agnostic and now I'm not so sure. <laughs> I was not bar mitzvah. I never went to temple. We were not observant. I certainly had a lot of friends who were observant and I've been, you know, to, to high, high, holiday, high holidays and I've been to ceremony, but I was not raised observant, no. I want to thank um, Rob Schwartz and Gene Steele very much for an awful all of your support. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, there's more. Under, actually, I think it's so cool that so many people turned out tonight on this topic of aging, living joyfully, creatively. I'm going to do a quick video that we're gonna put on Instagram. So I'm just gonna, if anyone wants to wave to the camera, it's like, yeah, check it out. We are interested in this topic. So if you wanna give a wave, yeah. Moonville, yeah. Massachusetts. Yeah, showing up. All Wisdom right. of Maury. Yeah. And last but not least, this is our mini Oprah moment. We have one attendee that generously donated two autographed copies of the Wisdom of Maury. So look underneath your seat. And there are two little tickets that have a copy of the book. Who has one? Yay, you get a book. And I take seats too. Oh, I wonder if some guests, if you look behind you in that third row there, is there a little?